the Space Subcommittee on, of the Committee on Science, Space, and Technology will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recess of the subcommittee at any time. I recognize myself for an opening statement. Good morning. I would like to welcome, welcome everyone to our markup of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration Authorization Act of 2013. We all have different ideas about the best way to prioritize activities at the agency, but we share a common desire for a strong and vibrant space program. The American people have always believed in pushing the boundaries of our frontier. This country is filled with young men and women who are eager to be on the front lines of the next big thing, to help redefine the limits on our capabilities. My goal is to ensure that Congress and this subcommittee does everything in its power to support the next generation of explorers and maintain America's leadership in space. I want to add that I personally believe that American leadership in space is a matter of national pride, but it's also a matter of national security. In order to protect the American space legacy, we must make hard choices, prioritize budgets, and give NASA direction for future endeavors. The bill before us today accomplishes those tasks and continues the direction that Congress provided in previous authorization acts in 2005, 2008, and 2010. This bill ensures the continued development of the next generation of human spaceflight vehicles by investing in the Space Launch System and Orion Crew Capsule. It also ensures efficient and effective utilization of the International Space Station, the unscheduled development of the Commercial Crew Program, and continued delivery of supplies with the Commercial Resupply Services Program. Funding authorized for the Science Mission Directorate ensures critical programs will continue on schedule. Over the last five years, the Earth Science Program has grown by more than 40 percent at the expense of other critical missions within the Science Mission Directorate and elsewhere in NASA. There are 13 agencies throughout the federal government that currently fund climate science research, but only one agency does space exploration and space science. This bill ensures a balanced portfolio of science mission programs by simply scaling back growth in the Earth Science budget from the last five years. It also prevents other agencies from using NASA as a piggy bank for projects they can't afford or can't justify. NASA's Earth Science Program is more than just climate change. The technologies developed by NASA increase agricultural yields, provide for more efficient land management, monitor resource utilization, and supports the warfighter on the battlefield. This bill allows NASA to focus on its core mission to develop the next generation of sensors and instruments rather than pay for other agencies' unfunded mandates. The programs, projects, and activities within the Aeronautics Mission Directorate and Space Technology Program will continue to receive funding for high-priority items, as well as continued guidance for the development of roadmaps and technologies that infuse technologies into commercial markets. While I feel strongly that it is the job of Congress to provide guidance and leave science to the scientists, this bill addresses two significant yet problematic administration proposals that are greatly lacking in details and budget justification. Specifically, this bill halts a proposal to consolidate NASA education programs into other agencies and prohibits NASA from beginning work on the asteroid retrieval mission until the administration can provide more detailed information. Regarding the proposed education and public outreach reorganization, it is clear that the requisite work for a shift of this magnitude was not completed before the proposal was made to Congress, and very little effort was made to communicate the reasons for this change to Congress. That is why the STEM education program reorganization has drawn criticism from both sides of the aisle. Additionally, the administration has proposed a mission to retrieve an asteroid and relocate it to lunar orbit for exploration by astronauts. This asteroid retrieval mission has not been through any type of mission formulation review, and as recently as two weeks ago, NASA was still soliciting ideas on how to do the mission without any clear direction on its purpose, budget, or technical requirements. Further, the hesitation from the scientific community to embrace such a concept should give us reason to pause in these tight budget times. This bill prohibits NASA from doing any work on the project until a report on the proposal and more details are provided to Congress. In both the case of the STEM education program reorganization and the asteroid retrieval mission, the administration communicated very little to Congress and failed to address the questions many lawmakers have regarding the proposal. In the future, it is my hope that the agency will work with Congress before announcing major policy shifts and program changes. Finally, the bill includes several measures to ensure good government practices and transparency within NASA, including reform for the use of Space Act agreements, changes to termination liability requirements, and stricter cost growth controls. In 2010, this committee developed a bipartisan NASA Authorization Act that was summarily ignored by the Senate. I do not want this to happen again. I believe we have much to offer to this debate. This subcommittee consists of members who are extremely invested in these issues. 
We are passionate about NASA's future and the future of American spaceflight. Given the current budget and political realities, I believe this bill offers some of the most responsible and workable solutions possible. We've gone to great lengths to work with NASA, members of the subcommittee, and the scientific community to arrive at this bill. It is my hope that we will be able to draw from our common desire to see NASA succeed, put aside some of our minor differences, and move NASA and the American space exploration forward. I now yield to the ranking member of the subcommittee, Ms. Edwards, for her remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're here today for the authorization, reauthorization of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, which is critical to this nation and to its economic strength. Unfortunately, in the past few years, we've not funded NASA adequately in a way that reflects that unique role. Notwithstanding the fact that the version of the bill we're marking up today incorporates some positive clarifications from the version initially circulated for discussion two weeks ago, the current version of the bill still undercuts NASA's funding in fiscal year 2014 by almost a billion dollars from the President's request. This is simply unacceptable. Not only does the committee's leadership's bill contain, not contain funding commensurate with the task NASA is being at, has been asked to undertake, it gives NASA additional unfunded mandates such as requiring NASA to establish a program to develop a sustained human presence on both the Moon and Mars while maintaining deep sequestration cuts over the life of the bill. In addition, while the committee print version of the majority's bill authorizes increases for the space launch system, the SLS account, over what was in the earlier discussion draft, the top line for the agency has not changed. I'm still trying to make sense of that change, especially when all of the exploration ground system funding authorized in the previous version of the bill appears to have gone away. The majority has either just jiggered the books without actually adding any new money to the SLS vehicle program, or they're telling the folks at Kennedy Space Center that they can forget about funding the exploration ground systems. I hope the chairman can clarify which it is. I'm also concerned about the bill's cuts to the account that funds management and operations at our NASA field centers, including Goddard near my district, Stennis, Kennedy Space Center, Marshall Space Flight Center, and the Johnson Space Center, among others. That account also funds NASA's uh, IT security measures and independent technical authority, an essential aspect of ensuring safety and mission assurance in NASA's projects. It's an account that has already been cut too much in recent years, and this bill would do even further damage. Further, reductions to the environment compliance and restoration may also have negative impacts on the investigation and cleanup of groundwater and soil contamination at the Kennedy Space Center, which is being conducted to comply with State of Florida mandates. I believe there's a way to ensure funding for these programs at NASA centers all over the country. I could go on, Mr. Chairman, but I think you get a sense of my concerns about this bill. And while I think we all share the goal of a strong and vibrant civil space program, I just can't see how we get there from here with this bill. And while some may say that authorizing funding at levels above sequestration may run contrary to the Budget Control Act, I have yet to find anything, anything in that act that stipulates the funding uh, that funding committees can authorize. That argument is simply a red herring. It doesn't exist in fact, and it doesn't exist in law. Funding NASA, our nation's crown jewel, at sequestration levels is a choice. It's not a legal requirement, and it's not a choice that I can support. That's why I'm submitting an amendment uh, at this markup today, which I hope will be the foundation for a continued bipartisan support and that will ensure a 21st century space innovation agenda for the multi-mission responsibilities of the agency, its people, and the thousands and thousands of highly paid workers in the private sector in this growing industry across the country and our academic community with a presence in every single state and in many of the congressional districts represented here on this committee. And with that, I yield. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. Pursuant to Committee Rule 2F and House Rule 112H4, the Chair announces that he may postpone roll call votes on matters on which the yeas and nays are ordered. Pursuant to notice, I now call up the committee print of the NASA Authorization Act of 2013 for markup. The clerk will report the bill. Committee print, HR, a bill to authorize the programs of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration and for other purposes. 
be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America. Without objection, the bill is considered as read. Does any member wish to be recognized on the bill? Ms. Edwards. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, uh, before we move on to my amendment, I do have a couple of questions about the underlying committee print that's being marked up today. The original majority draft bill included $318 million for the exploration ground systems. This account funds act activities that support ground operations at Kennedy Space Center for the Space Launch System and Orion. For example, this funding would include launch pad modifications, which are critically needed to enable 2014 and 2017 test flights. But in looking through the committee print that's noticed for today's markup, I can't find the item anymore. I see that the committee print has increased SLS funding over the previous draft. So I'm wondering, Mr. Chairman, if the elimination of the exploration ground systems account is intended to eliminate those activities, or have you rolled those activities into the SLS count, account? If it's the latter, then you are basically just providing the same amount of money for the SLS vehicle program as, in, as was in the original draft. I just want clarification on what's being provided in this bill for the SLS vehicle development and what's provided for ground systems, and I'd be happy to yield. Ms. Edwards, I, I do believe that the amounts were rolled together, and as they've been in the past, and the President's budget was the first time that they've been broken out. Um, but if staff has anything to add, they're more than welcome to. Um, yes, sir. The, the, uh, that budget for exploration ground systems was uh, incorporated in the overall SLS program line. Yes, sir. So I just, I, I just want to be clear then. Um, does that mean that, uh, that what we're considering this morning in an FY 2014 appropriation level of $1.78 billion dollars um, because if that does that include the 299 million for exploration ground systems and then the vehicle development that's listed as 1.476 billion? Yeah, I apologize. I don't have the exact number in front of me, but it, from the com, from the discussion draft to the committee print, th the same amount, which I believe was 318 million for exploration ground systems, was incorporated. Okay in the SLS program. Okay, it looks like that was, those are numbers that were actually coming from the Appropriations Committee subcommittee. Um, so I just wanted to, be, wanted to make sure that um, the, the print that we're looking at today, is it comparable to that? Are, you, are we looking at the same numbers? We're looking at the number, comparing the, the I believe 318, and I, I actually think, uh, uh, staff is uh, briefing the chair on this now. It's 318, which I believe is the president's request level, not the appropriations, uh, FY14 appropriations that were just reported out. Okay, well, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm just, I'm still a little bit confused, but I want to say it seems like a little bit of a shell game with regard to the exploration account. I think the math is pretty simple. The rocket costs X, the spacecraft costs Y, the ground systems, including the launch facilities, cost Z. And if you add those up, then you should have the cost of the program. And so it's just kind of hard for me to see that you can underfund those activities in some, but also still meet the mission uh, milestones. Uh, if you're going to shift money from one part of the program to another, it really just doesn't get you there. I don't think you can launch a rocket without a launch facility, and there's not much use in launching a rocket without a spacecraft, and so I'm concerned that we're setting NASA up to fail uh, with the requirements that are at, at this funding level, if I understand the levels right, and I yield back. Does any other member wish to be recognized? Is there any further discussion on the bill? Hearing none, I ask unanimous consent that the bill is considered open to amendment at any point and that members proceed with amendments without objections, so ordered. Mr. Chairman. The, the only amendment on the roster is an amendment in the nature of a substitute offered by the gentlelady from Maryland, Ms. Edwards. The clerk shall report the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to the committee print offered by Ms. Edwards of Maryland. Strike all after the enacting clause and insert the following. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading without objection, so ordered. 
I recognize Ms. Edwards for five minutes to explain the amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this am amendment in the nature of a substitute provides a pragmatic path forward that will give NASA a clear sense of purpose and direction in a way that also recognizes the nation's need for fiscal restraint. In the 1958 Space Act and countless NASA authorizations since that time uh, that have stated the policy that NASA is and should remain a multi-mission agency with a balanced and robust set of core missions in science, aeronautics, space technology, human spaceflight, and exploration. My amendment continues that long-standing tradition. Mr. Chairman, this amendment does a number of significant and important um, things. It pr preserves NASA's purchasing power relative to fiscal year 2012 enacted levels by authorizing $18.1 billion for the fiscal year 2014 with inflationary increases over the three-year authorization period of 2014 through 2016. It provides a clear goal for NASA's human space flight program of a crewed mission to the surface of Mars and requires a roadmap which identifies intermediate destinations and activities that contribute to enabling the effective achievement of that goal. The amendment recognizes the space launch system, an Orion crew vehicle, as the highest priorities for carrying out the Mars goal and authorizes needed increases to keep those programs on track bringing SLS to $1.8 billion by fiscal year 2016. It emphasizes congressional commitment to safety to NASA's human spaceflight activities by requiring an independent review of NASA's commercial crew safety processes and procedures and provides for other measures that will, will enable full government insight and oversight to ensure safety. The amendment provides robust funding for commercial crew system development of $700 million a year. It maintains our commitment to the International Space Station operations through 2020 and initiates a process for determining if and how long ISS should operate beyond 2020. The amendment authorizes increases for ISS research to augment discovery-based science and maximize the full and productive utilization of this unique laboratory. It restores planetary science to $1.5 billion annual funding following recent cuts to the program. The amendment also maintains a sound earth sciences program authorized at the president's request that ensures observing systems development and advances research, knowledge, and applied data uses that benefit society. And Mr. Chairman, I want to highlight some of the important benefits of earth science that I think are so important that may go unnoticed. Monitoring vegetation and crop conditions, mapping the extent of flood water from active floods to help inform local and regional officials. Even routine use by operational weather forecasters in the southern region of the National Weather Service through NASA's short-term prediction research and transition center in Huntsville, Alabama. I could go on. My amendment would also ensure that NASA has sufficient resources to keep its environmental cleanup commitments in communities across the United States, including ongoing and much-needed work at the Santa Susana Field Laboratory in Southern California which was the site of a partial nuclear meltdown in 1959. The amendment sustains a stable aeronautics research program consistent with fiscal year 2012 enacted levels that supports research priorities, strategic initiatives, and flight demonstrations. It recognizes the importance of investing in space technology to enable future missions, spur innovation, and contribute to economic growth and job creation. The amendment also sustains NASA's science, technology, engineering, and mathematics education activities and continues current agency education and outreach activities supported by scientists and engineers. In addition, Mr. Chairman, my amendment includes a number of good government provisions, such as establishing measures to strengthen NASA's cost estimation and fiscal management practices to minimize cost overruns and projects and to assess the capabilities and resources needed to expand NASA's near-Earth object programs to include smaller objects. The amendment is also fiscally responsible. It puts NASA back on track to greatness and provides flexibility in how the agency will implement the engineering and scientific details. Now, some may question how this amendment can authorize funding at levels that it does, that it does without running counter to the Budget Control Act. As I've stated before, I've yet to find anything in the Budget Control Act that stipulates what funding of committees can authorize because the Budget Control Act doesn't limit authorization in any way. You can be fiscally conservative and still support this amendment. 
in a federal budget that's over $3.5 trillion, we can find the funding, funding that's necessary to allow NASA to meet its responsibilities and to expand its purchasing power. The fact is we're pre presented with a choice. We can choose to drastically reduce our federal investments in civil space, or we can take a backseat to the future of space exploration, or we can choose to invest federal resources to ensure U.S. leadership in global space science and exploration to ensure that the United States reaps those dividends, enhances competitiveness, innovation, high-skilled jobs, and inspiring goals that stimulate the next generation. That's what this amendment does. It makes a strong and clear choice to invest in a 21st century space innovation agenda. Mr. Chair Chairman, in conclusion, I hope that we can work together with members on both sides of the aisle to ensure that NASA's mission is clear, that it continues to inspire the public and workforce, and the levels of resources we provide enable the ag agency to be successful. And I hope all members on both sides will see the value both for their congressional districts, but also for this nation, and support this amendment. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. I now recognize myself for five minutes. I would like to thank the minority for their active participation in the process. This committee has a long history of bipartisan work, and it is helpful to have a product from the minority defining their priorities. In the substitute amendment, I have found many areas of agreement, including a commitment to the exploration of our solar system and specifically to Mars with adequate funding for the Space Launch System and Orion Crew Capsule. The amendment also includes a similar commitment to the Commercial Crew Program and International Space Station. I also share the minority's commitment to an active aeronautics mission directorate and space technology program. I think it is clear there are many areas the majority and the minority can agree on. One issue in particular that I feel needs to be addressed is the top line funding in the amendment. The Budget Control Act of 2011 was passed by a Republican-controlled House, a Democrat-controlled Senate, and signed by a Democratic President. Members on both sides of the House Science, Space, and Technology Committee voted for this legislation. I share the concerns of many of my colleagues regarding sequestration and the indiscriminate way cuts are made to programs. In the House, we passed two replacement solutions that would cut spending in a more responsible and balanced way. I and many of my colleagues stand ready to work with the Senate and the administration to find alternatives to the Budget Control Act. But at this time, it is the reality under which we must operate. Until we find a way to reform entitlements and mandatory spending, the discretionary agencies will continue to see shrinking budgets. And at this time, I'd like staff to uh, post a chart on the screen. Might be a little hard to see. On the screen in front of you are, are going to be three charts produced by the American Association for the Advancement of Science using data from the federal budget. The first chart shows the composition of the federal budget in 1970. Approximately one-third of the budget was allocated to mandatory spending programs. The other two-third was devoted to discretionary accounts, including 3.5% for non-defense R&D spending. Next chart, please. As you can see on the next slide, today approximately two-thirds of our federal budget is devoted to mandatory spending, which leaves only one-third for discretionary programs, including about 1.5% for non-defense R&D spending. The final chart, next chart, please. The final chart shows the projections for federal spending in the future. Sadly, this projection demonstrates that by the year 2017, mandatory spending by the federal government will have crowded out discretionary funding to approximately one-fourth of the overall budget with only 1.3% for non-defense R&D. As you can see from these charts, discretionary research and development spending, particularly at NASA, is not the problem. Everyone recognizes the valuable investment in our future that every dollar spent on NASA provides. The real problem is the growth in mandatory spending, and it will only get worse. The ranking member's amendment states in Section 101 that NASA's share of the Federal Discretionary Budget Authority has declined significantly relative to even its post-Apollo historical average. The charts I just mentioned clearly er illustrate how we got here. The only way to ensure that NASA remains a world leader in space, something I think every one of us here can agree on, is to reform mandatory spending. Failure to do so will result not only continued sequestration levels into the future, but perhaps the collapse of our space program altogether. As lawmakers, we have a responsibility to put forth serious policies with realistic approaches to the current fiscal environment and the constraints of the law. Many of my friends on the other side of the aisle voted for the Budget Control Act, and while we might agree that it is far from ideal, ideal we've yet to see an alternative. Until we do, we must make serious and good faith efforts to do the best we can with the hand we've been dealt. 
That is the intent of the bill we have today. In 2010, this committee developed the Bipartisan NASA Authorization Act that was summarily ignored by the Senate. And as a result, Congress failed to provide NASA with the stability and guidance necessary for its long-term goals. I do not want this to happen again. If we follow the minority's lead and either defer to the Senate or authorize unrealistic funding levels, we risk leaving NASA adrift for another four years. I refuse to let this happen. The American people deserve better. So in closing, I welcome the input and efforts of the minority to work alongside us to replace sequestration with fiscally responsible alternatives that can pass both houses, but with the current realities we face, I cannot support this proposal as a serious or workable solution. Are there any other members that would like to be recognized? Ms. Johnson, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to speak in strong support of the amendment being offered by Ms. Edwards. I am proud to be an original co-sponsor of the bill on which this amendment is based because I care deeply about the future of NASA and our space program. The authorization legislation we are marking up today is deeply flawed. You don't have to take my word for it. You can just read the testimony of the expert witnesses called by the majority to review it at last month's legislative hearing. As a result, I had hoped that we could not, we would not be doing a markup on this bill today, but instead would be holding hearings to hear from those who will be impacted by the arbitrary cuts recommended and policy directives contained in the bill. For example, how do the center directors at Stennis, Kennedy, Marshall, and Johnson plan to deal with the almost 10% cut across agency support budget that this bill will force on top of the cuts they have already had to absorb over the past several years? What will be the impact of the nation's ability to deal with the critical influence of climate on weather given one-third cut in NASA's Earth Science budget? How many important space technology development projects already underway will have to be curtailed to accommodate the cuts made in this bill? I could go on, Mr. Chairman, but I think my point is clear. The bill before us will hurt the NASA centers and workforce, cripple the agency's ability to carry out all of the responsibilities the nation has given it, and put NASA on a path to mediocrity. That is why Ms. Edwards' amendment is so important. As she has already outlined, her amendment will put NASA on a sustainable path, give NASA inspiring but attainable goals, and provide the resources needed to achieve those goals. And in that regard, I want to reiterate her point that this is a fiscally responsible amendment. Some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle may say that they have to cut NASA's funding in the NASA authorization bill because of sequestration. That's simply not true. Now, Nowhere does the Budget Control Act put limits on what amounts can be authorized, not anywhere. If members want to force NASA's authorization down to sequestration levels, they should not pretend that any law is forcing them to do so, because it's not. And so I think each member who chooses to cut NASA's budget needs to explain why he or she thinks that would be good for the nation. As authorizers, we have a responsibility to promote the most effective policies for the agencies under our jurisdiction and to provide them with the resources to implement those policies. Ms. Edwards' amendment does just that for NASA, and I urge members on both sides of the aisle in all of their honesty to support this amendment. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. I would like to clarify that our, our bill does if a budget agreement is met would uh, allow for increased funding in several programs. But that's if a budget agreement is met. And I now recognize Mr. Brooks for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Uh, let's be clear about the splitting of hairs that is transpiring. The Budget Control Act is why we are where we are. Uh, while it may not specifically talk about authorization, it certainly does talk about how much money can be spent on a variety of different programs, including the program that is before us today. Let's also be clear about who's responsible for the Budget Control Act. The President of the United States, his idea with sequestration. The Speaker of the House, Republican, strongly supported it. The Democrat Senate Majority Leader strongly supported it. A majority of the House members supported it. A majority of the Senate members supported it. A majority of the Republicans serving in Congress supported it. And a majority of the Democrats in Congress supported it. Uh, I voted against it. I was in the minority. Uh, some of us who voted against it foresaw the problem that was coming. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we were not able to uh, achieve success in trying to prevent that bill from passing that has resulted in the position we are in today. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about NASA, and I very much appreciate the minority trying to fund NASA to greater degrees. Uh, I recall the 1960s in Huntsville, Alabama, with Redstone Arsenal and Marshall Space Flight Center, the birthplace of the uh, space program for the United States of America, the pride that I felt as the Apollo rockets were being uh, tested the Saturn V rockets nearby and the ground would shake and the windows and the um, uh, dishes and cups, they would shake in our cupboards. And the uh, follow-up with the landing on the moon, the pride that we felt in 1969 with that, the exhi uh, exhibition of American exceptionalism doing so on, something no one else in the world was able to do, followed by the space station and the space shuttle and the Hubble telescope and Mars exploration, again, things that the United States of America has done that no one else has been able to do. And how uh, we have declined so greatly, how our, we're now reduced to having to hitch a ride with the Russians in order to service the International Space Station that we paid as taxpayers so much to help fund. And so I regret the direction that NASA has taken. At the same time, however, we must be cognizant as to why we are where we are today. Quite frankly, my friends across the aisle act like Santa Claus, but at the same time, they have been wholly and completely financially irresponsible over the decades. And it's that financial irresponsibility who has put us in, that has put us in the position that we as a country are in today. We are suffering from four consecutive trillion dollar deficits, unheard of in the history of the United States of America. We're about to blow through a $17 trillion debt mark with consequential, significant, and adverse effects on our economy and on our country. Uh, the General Accounting, uh, Accounting uh, Office has estimated that the interest payment last year was $251 billion. You saw the chart up on the screen that suggested it's $566 billion. If we had not had financially irresponsible policies in years past by both parties to varying degrees, then we would have plenty of money today to fund NASA. But unfortunately, that financial irresponsibility that has put us in the position where America as a country is at risk of a debilitating insolvency and bankruptcy is forcing us to make rather difficult decisions that none of us here uh, wish we were in the position of having to uh, make. But let's get to the root cause of this problem, these trillion-dollar deficits, this $17 billion debt mark that we're about to blow through the increasing risk of that debilitating insolvency and bankruptcy. The root cause of the problem is, quite frankly, because my friends across the aisle are not able to say no when it comes to welfare and giveaway programs, things that are not productive as opposed to things that are productive like science and exploration in NASA. That's what puts us in the position we are in today. Means-tested welfare, by way of example now, is a trillion dollars a year. Think about that. A trillion dollars a year in giveaway programs, 700 billion plus of that is federal government in nature. If we were to just cut the giveaway programs by 1%, 1%, that would generate $7 billion a year at minimum at the federal government level that then could be used to make NASA exceptional again. But my friends across the aisle absolutely refuse to be financially responsible. They continue to insist on being financially irresponsible. And as long as we're going to spend our hard-earned taxpayer dollars on financial irresponsible welfare programs, then we're not going to have the money that is needed for national security. We're not going to have the money for national uh, programs such as NASA. And we're going to continue to see this decline. So I urge my colleagues across the aisle to be financially responsible, to start proposing cuts in the giveaway programs that would then free up money that can be used 
to continue American exceptional in space. And because of that, because of their refusal to do what is necessary, I'm going to vote against their substitute. I now recognize Ms. Wilson for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, one of the hallmarks of this nation is our ability to dream big and to achieve the impossible. NASA has exemplified this spirit for the past 55 years. As members of Congress, we have a responsibility to keep this spirit alive. This means ensuring NASA has the resources to continue reaching for new heights and discovering the unknown for the benefit of all humankind. The bill presented by the majority unfortunately falls short of what's needed in terms of resources. It eviscerates NASA purchasing power over the next two years by keeping the agency's budget at sequestration levels. We had two leading experts testify before this committee that this bill asked NASA to do too much with too little. This bill moves NASA away from its position as a multi-mission agency to one almost entirely focused on human space exploration. We can do better. The legislation introduced by Ms. Edwards would preserve NASA's purchasing power relative to fiscal year 2012 enacted levels by authorizing $18.1 billion. It would pro provide a clear goal of establishing a human landing on Mars as NASA's primary human space exploration goal. It will continue our utilization of the International Space Station until 2020 while looking at the feasibility of extending the life of the ISS. It will return planetary science funding to 1.5 billion and maintain a robust Earth sciences program. Additionally, it would take a hard look at issues such as defense and space debris. I urge my colleagues to consider all of the benefits that come from adequately funding NASA. Technological innovation, discovery, job creation, and educational inspiration that will capture the imagination of our nation's people, both young and old. I'm proud to be an original co-sponsor of the legislation introduced by Ms. Edwards, and I urge you to support it. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady yields back. Is there further discussion on the amendment? Ms. Bonamici is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to state my strong support for the amendment offered by my colleague, Ms. Edwards. Her amendment and the bill contained within it uh, that I'm proud to co-sponsor adjust many of the imprudent priorities that are set out in the NASA authorization bill put forward for a markup today. One of the glaring examples of short-sightedness in the bill that we're seeking to replace with this amendment is the drastic cut to NASA's Earth science programs. I, I want to say that when Dr. Sullivan from NOAA testified in the Environment Subcommittee, she's a former astronaut, she said you can really tell when you're in space looking down at Earth how interconnected everything is. And since becoming a member of the Space Subcommittee, and certainly since the draft of the majority's NASA Authorization Act, I've heard from constituents across the industry and in the research community about the important work that's supported by NASA's Earth Science Research. Researchers at Oregon State University, in my home state, for example, worked with NASA and the Navy to develop a technology that's currently deployed on the International Space Station. And this technology can capture precise ocean images to provide important data on ocean and coastal zone health. Accurate measurements of ocean health are key for the maritime industry, not only in my district, but on all coastlines. And overall, a better understanding of ocean patterns and temperatures will improve our understanding of the Earth's systems and the variability of weather patterns. This is just one example of the important work funded by NASA Earth Science. Others include monitoring for floods, drought, and fires. The National Academies recently reported that NASA's aging Earth observation system threatens a disruption in information that can help detect long-term climate tra trends that contribute to severe weather patterns. 
And also, Mr. Chairman and committee, uh, when extreme weather conditions over Southwest Asia pose significant challenges to our military operations conducted during the 2003 Operation Iraqi Freedom Campaign, the Department of Defense used NASA research satellite imagery to distinguish airborne dust from the surface and other atmospheric features. This resulted in a revised enhancement useful in observing and tracking, tracking the dust storms. Uh, the uh, Department of Defense said that the product was invaluable, and that helped, uh, Mr. Chairman, to keep our troops safe across the world. So, uh, Mr. Chairman and Committee, on June 6, excuse me, June 19th, the Space Subcommittee held a hearing on the NASA Authorization Act that we're marking up here today. And in that hearing, both of the witnesses who were invited to appear by the majority expressed serious concern with cuts to NASA's Earth Science Research Budget. In his testimony, Dr. Stephen, Stephen Squires called the cuts to Earth science alarming. Uh, I, I want to repeat that, alarming cuts. He urged balanced reduction across the space science disciplines if reductions are necessary at all. For this and other reasons, I strongly support the substitute legislation being proposed by Rep Representative Edwards, and I urge my colleagues to do the responsible thing and support this amendment. Uh, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentlelady yields back. Is there further discussion on the amendment? Hearing none, the Mr. Vote. Chairman. There's more. <laughs> the gentleman is recognized for thank five you. minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, I do feel that both the underlying bill and the, nat the amendment in the nature of the substitute uh, have, in my view, too much emphasis on expensive manned space flight to the possible detriment of unmanned uh, space flight um, or also incentives for private sector space flight um, beyond Earth orbit. Um, and uh, I am concerned that we, this committee still hasn't done a sober cost-benefit analysis of uh, the, the true nature of the U.S. government um, putting forth a, a goal such as landing human beings on Mars. Um, why exactly are we planning on doing this? Is it for sentimental reasons, because it's out there? Is it uh, because of parochial reasons in our districts? Is it really for scientific reasons? Because I suspect we get a bigger bang for our buck with unmanned or with incentives for private sector manned flight. And I remain skeptical of the large, uh, vast scope of federal government-supported manned space flight. But I will support the substitute, and let me tell you why. Because as bad, it, it, whatever we want to say about manned flight, we can have that debate. But to put in the goals of having this manned space flight without the proper funding is not only dishonest, it's also dangerous. Two shuttle disasters should tell us this. You're essentially setting lofty goals with a pittance behind them. Uh, that is like, uh, to borrow one of my colleagues' analogy and adapt it, it's like promising like Santa Claus, but delivering only coal in NASA's stocking. That is not acceptable. So if we're going to set these lofty goals, we better at least uh, look at the funding behind the human beings that we're going to be sending out to this flight. I also believe that um, many of the things that NASA does best and have the biggest bang for our buck, such as the Earth sciences, are not funded adequately in the majority bill. And so I will uh, support uh, the substitute bill. It's much, much improved uh, from the majority bill. I yield back. Mr. The gentleman yields back. I, I reserve. Can I reserve? The gentleman already yielded back. Mr. Barry, you recognized for five minutes. You know, I'll yield to uh, my colleague from Maryland. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Barra, for yielding. Um, I just wanted to ask for the uh, purposes of understanding the uh, minority and the majority bill by comparison. Um, is it my understanding, and perhaps Mr. Brooks knows this, um, whether the programs that are supported at um, the Marshall Space Flight Center, which I believe is in your uh, district, um, you know, a couple, several hundred actually companies uh, that do business there and with thousands of workers and whether uh, the minority proposal uh, to with significant reductions in the SLS Orion uh, program would result in job loss in Alabama and I would yield for the purposes of Mr. Brooks being able to respond to that question. 
I like the additional funding that is in the minority proposal for the Marshall Space Flight Center and for NASA generally. However, uh, it is financially irresponsible because the minority does not come up with a way to pay for it. If the minority were to propose an amendment whereby we cut some of the wealth transfer programs that they hold so dear to themselves and shift those funds to productive things like Marshall Space Flight Center and NASA, I would Thank wholly support you. it. Um, Thank reclaiming, you. Reclaiming my time. One, we, can't, we cannot shift from, um, from those accounts to the other, and so I guess I'm just um, curious as a member of Congress um, who wants to see that we adequately fund um, an SLS and Orion uh, program that um, the minority bill, if enacted, would result in the loss of thousands of jobs at Marshall Space Flight Center and the attendant um, companies in the private sector uh, supporting, who, who uh, have support for that work. And in addition to that, um, I understand, and uh, perhaps Mr. Posey of Florida could uh, respond to this question as to how many jobs will be lost um, in and around Kennedy Space Center with the attendant cuts in funding to those, um, those programs and to the work that, uh, that goes on at the uh, Kennedy Space Center. Uh, Mr. Posey? Well, thank you for asking that. Uh, <clears throat> the President has pretty much already devastated the employment at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, when he campaigned in Brevard County, he said he wanted to close the gap after he was elected, he would close the gap between the shuttle program and the Constellation program. But after he got elected, he canceled the Constellation program. Uh, that made the gap eternal. It didn't close the gap. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to tell you my time, um, Reclaiming my time, I just want to point out uh, for the gentleman from Florida that uh, given the cuts that are proposed uh, that would result in loss of jobs at the ground processing uh, directorate, which was opened in, uh, in 2011, uh, supporting 21st century ground systems programs and the space launch system and heavy lift rocket, it would be clear that would, there would be a significant uh, additional job loss, in in, in, um, including what uh, the gentleman has already suggested, and that if he would take a look, um, and I would urge the gentleman from, um, uh, from Alabama as well to take a look at the majority uh, proposal because um, both of those proposals, in fact, um, ensure that we have a 21st century innovation program that would grow, both sustain and grow jobs in and around Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama and the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And with that, uh, I would yield back to Mr. Barra. Great. I'll go ahead and yield back my time. Right. Mr. Barra yields back. I'd just like to remind people our goal is to bring a workable bill that can pass both houses. The reality is that if we ignore the Budget Control Act, which many of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle voted for, the bill is dead on arrival in both the House and the Senate. It would never make it to the House floor and, ironically, would not have, would not have the unanimous consent it needs to move it in the Senate. If there is no further discussion on the amendment, here none, the vote occurs on the Edwards Amendment in the nature of a substitute. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. No. The nays have it, and the amendment Mr. is not agreed Mr. to. Mr. Chairman, I would ask for a recorded vote. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Plazo. Mr. Plazo votes no. Mr. Brooks. No. Mr. Brooks votes no. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall votes no. Mr. Rohrabacher. Mr. Rohrabacher votes no. Mr. Lucas. No. Mr. Lucas votes no. Mr. McCall. No. Mr. McCall votes no. Mr. Bashan. No. Mr. Bashan votes no. Mr. Stockman. No. Mr. Stockman votes no. Mr. Posey. No. Mr. Posey votes no. Mr. Schweikert. No. Mr. Schweikert votes no. Mr. Bridenstein. No. Mr. Bridenstein votes no. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart votes no. Ms. Edwards. Aye. Ms. Edwards votes aye. Ms. Wilson. Ms. Wilson votes aye. Ms. Bonamici. Aye. Ms. Bonamici votes aye. Mr. Maffei. Aye. Mr. Maffei votes aye. Mr. Kennedy. Aye. Mr. Kennedy votes aye. Mr. Kilmer. Aye. Mr. Kilmer votes aye. Mr. Barra. Aye. Mr. Barra votes aye. Mr. Vesey. Aye. Mr. Vesey votes aye. Ms. Brownlee. 
Mr. Ms. Brownlee votes aye. The clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, nine members voted aye, 12 members voted nay. The amendment is not agreed to. Are there any further amendments? Here none and, and a reporting quorum being present. The question is on the committee print. The NASA Authorization Act of 2013 is amended. Those in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Opposed? No. no. The ayes have it, and the bill is agreed to. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think that we were supposed to have a short colloquy here, for, or, or is that uh, at this moment? Is that Mr. This Chairman, moment? I'd ask for the recorded the vote. The gentleman from California All right. is recognized. Mr. All right. Mr. Chairman, I'd ask for a recorded vote. We will allow you to have some time after the vote. All right, not a problem. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Plazo. Aye. Mr. Plazo votes aye. Mr. Brooks. Aye. Mr. Brooks votes aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall votes aye. Mr. Warbacher. Yes. Mr. Warbacher votes aye. Mr. Lucas. Mr. McCall. Aye. Mr. McCall votes aye. Mr. Bouchon. Aye. Mr. Bouchon votes aye. Mr. Stockman. Aye. Mr. Stockman votes aye. Mr. Posey. Aye. Mr. Posey votes aye. Mr. Schweikert. Yes. Mr. Schweikert votes aye. Mr. Bridenstine. Yes. Mr. Bridenstine votes aye. Mr. Stewart. Aye. Mr. Stewart votes aye. Ms. Edwards. Aye. Ms. Edwards votes no. Ms. Wilson. Aye. Ms. Wilson votes no. Ms. Bonamici. Yes. Ms. Bonamici votes no. Mr. Maffei. Mr. Maffei votes no. Mr. Kennedy. Mr. Kennedy votes no. Mr. Kilmer. Mr. Kilmer votes no. Mr. Barra. Mr. Barra votes no. Mr. Vesey. Mr. Vesey votes no. Ms. Brownlee. Ms. Brownlee votes no. The clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, 11 members voted aye, 9 members voted nay. The bill is agreed to. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. I move that the committee print the NASA Authorization Act of 2013 be favorably reported to the full committee on science, space, and technology, and the staff be authorized to make any necessary technical and conforming changes. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, at this time, I would like to recognize Mr. Rohrbacher. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Overall, this bill is very supportive of the commercial crew program. This is in large part to due to the efforts of yourself, uh, Mr. Chairman, and you've done an outstanding job. Let me just note that uh, you've done and shown some true leadership on space issues. And uh, uh, of course, we know that uh, you're trying to be, do what you can to make sure that Americans are, they have the space vehicles that uh, will be launched from American soil and that uh, we are actually a, the player in space rather than going off and, and having to contract with other countries. Uh, there are a few places in this legislation, there are a few places in this legislation that have the opposite effect, and that's Section uh, 215, uh, which mandates specific procurement methods uh, for any further work on commercial crew programs. Uh, I believe this section provides a, a little legislative micromanagement that doesn't necessarily match the intent of the rest of the bill. I would note that the purpose of pursuing this commercial approach, which began during the Bush administration, was quickly, uh, was too quickly uh, develop and to certify multiple safe, reliable, less expensive, and more readily available crew transportation options especially when compared uh, to space shuttle or Russian Soyuz as their alternatives. Uh, this approach has already proven itself and is, uh, of course, providing significant technical benefits and cost savings through our commercial cargo program. Forcing commercial crew into a cost type contract, as Section 215 would do, would undermine all the benefits of the program, um, 
all the benefits the program is designed to bring about. Uh, that would result, of course, in rising prices, delays in availability, and in subjecting the system to potential unending requirements creep, which is something that we all wanted to avoid. It is my understanding that the section uh, is largely intended to address some of the concerns brought up by the NASA's uh, Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel, uh, who serve, of course, as advisory advisors to NASA. Obviously, this panel plays a critical role, and safety is and will remain a critical factor for space efforts. The members of this panel have a deep level of experience in aerospace programs, and their views are important. But their experience is based primarily on older and previous models. The ASAP panel certainly has a responsibility. You may take my phone. <laughs> as a responsibility to ask questions that they've been asking, and of course they should expect to get responses to their concerns. But we need to be cautious and that because we have our own authority and we don't want to make sure that, uh, we want to make sure that we don't allow them, the ASAP, to write requirements in for our space program, and in this case, their requirements would appear uh, to revert back and revert the commercial crew program to an old methodology, one which, of course, they are more comfortable with, but one what would, which would undermine the intended benefits of the new method. Uh, this isn't just an important uh, factor for NASA, because ASAP is one of over 900 federal advisory committees which provide advice and recommendations to 50 federal agencies. We must not open the door <coughs> to allowing these advisory committees to actually become the policy setting committees and to be able to set requirements which have the force of law. <clears throat> Safety, as I said, is of course a critical factor, but ships are not built so they can stay in port where it's totally safe. I, uh, I sat here, as did many of you, uh, as Administrator Bolden testified before us about crew safety, with the tears welling up in his eyes as he remembered his friends who were lost in the Challenger and Columbia disasters. I am certain uh, that uh, Charlie and everyone else at NASA involved in the commercial crew program has safety as one of their top priorities and has continued to have this, as, and will continue to have this, through every phase of development and certification. I know that SpaceX, Sierra Nevada, and Boeing take safety as seriously as possible, as does everyone in this, uh, in this committee. As I said, I do not believe it is anyone's intent to undermine the commercial crew program, but we have some, and we've had some conversations on this, uh, and especially th since this section, uh, uh, was added just last week uh, in the revision of the legislation that we have and just passed a moment ago. I would uh, also note that this is why this perfection process that we have is so important to getting legislation right, and uh, we have different time periods where we can actually make it right, as we have discussed in yesterday's markup. Uh, I have had a conversation with some of my colleagues and know that they share these serious concerns about Section 215. I think the legislation would be better served without that section. It is inconsistent with the legislation's very strong funding and policy support for the commercial crew program overall, support uh, which I, again, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your support of that. And finally, although I will be voting and have voted today uh, for this bill, it is with the understanding that we will continue to work to make changes that address these concerns before we proceed to a full committee markup. And I would like to uh, ask uh, the chairman at this time to confirm that that is his understanding as well. Yes, I appreciate the vice chairman's remarks, and of course we will work with him as we move forward to full committee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. If there's no further discussion. Mr. Chairman, may I make some uh, remarks with respect to the final bill? M Mr. Brooks is recognized. Thank you. 
Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, I stated that I had reservations about whether the space launch system would be on schedule with the draft uh, bill that we had at that time. Uh, $1.45 billion, uh, unsure that that would be sufficient, uh, felt we needed to be closer to the $1.8 billion range. Additionally, today we've had comments tossed about that as many as thousands of Marshall Space Flight Center uh, folks may lose their jobs. I find that statement rather paradoxical and know of no, know of no factual basis for that kind of statement having been made. Why, why do I find it paradoxical? It's because this bill, even in the draft stage, provided $70 million to $100 million more for the space launch system than the President had asked for. So if there is this kind of threat to NASA jobs at the Marshall Space Flight Center, one has to ask why the President would have asked for even more cuts, given that uh, we are increasing the amount of money that is being spent uh, on the space launch system. Um, some other aspects of this bill, though, uh, get us closer to the $1.8 billion that we need. Uh, first and foremost, it merges the Space Launch System and Exploration Ground Systems accounts into one line for a total of $1.802 billion, most importantly, with the Space Launch System Program Manager providing oversight with how this money will be spent. That gives us some additional degree of confidence. It also includes a section that emphasizes that the focus of the Space Launch System Program is on developing 130 metric ton capacity, which is what we need if we're going to extend our space exploration beyond current capabilities. It also, very importantly, includes a termination liability provision, which could free up an additional $125 million for the Space Launch System. All of these things are significant improvements, improvements worked with uh, the staff, committee staff, and also Chair the chairman Mr. of chairman, this committee and the Mr. committee chairman. as a whole that uh, collectively uh, results in the support of the people who are behind in the private sector, the space launch system. And so that's why I am wholeheartedly endorsing this bill, given the financial limitations we as a country face. Mr. Chairman, I don't want to belabor this. We should be adjourning. We've already reported the uh, the bill out, and I would just note for the record that uh, the fiscal 2014 request was $1.384.9 uh, million. The, um, fis the uh, Democratic uh, alternative is $1.65, and the Republican um, uh, is $1.802, but again, that is all of those lines tallied together. And so um, all of us are, frankly, above what the president, um, what the president requested. Um, but we've reported the bill out. It's time for us to adjourn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. If there's no further discussion, that completes our business. This concludes the subcommittee markup. The subcommittee on space stands adjourned.